In organic chemistry, we have an interesting organic molecule called cyclopantadiene, which has the following structure. Ship something like home plate. So we have the five member ring, makes it a pentane of some sort. Said it has two double bonds, makes it a diene. So that gives us cyclopentadiene. And we notice it has, so it has the chemical formula, C5H6. And this molecule is mostly planar, but we have hydrogen above and a hydrogen behind the plane. Now, one interesting thing about this, even though it's a hydrocarbon, it's a hydrocarbon that actually has an appreciable acidity. So that means it will actually lose H+. And if it loses H+, we get the following result. We actually get a planar molecule. So we get C5H5 with a minus one charge. And this resulting C5H5 minus, we call cyclopentadienyl anion. So we end up getting a five member ring where the electrons are delocalized over the entire ring. And it has an overall negative charge, which we'll notice this way. Now, because we originally had five carbon atoms in our pi conjugated system, we had five pi electrons and then the overall extra electron here from having lost one of the hydrogens gives us a total of six pi electrons. Because we recall the formula 4n plus 2, where n is a integer, so the Huckel's rule, we notice that something with 4n plus 2 pi electrons will be aromatic. So therefore, here we have a five-member aromatic ring. And in inorganic chemistry, we tend to refer to this particular species using the symbol CP, or sometimes CP minus to emphasize the fact that it is an anion. So the cyclopentadienyl anion is an interesting species because one, it's the conjugate base of a weakly acidic hydrocarbon, that's interesting that way, but it has a more interesting importance in that it can tend to bind to transition metals to form interesting um, uh, organometallic compounds. And the most important organometallic compound uh, that this constituents uh, constitutes is a compound called ferrocene. So let's talk about ferrocene. Because ferrocene is one of those compounds of enormous importance. Ferrocene. So ferrocene, if we look at it from the side, let's do it like a side view first, we have a CP ring, another CP ring, and then in the center, we have iron. And because this overall molecule is neutral, we know each of the two CP rings, I'm just gonna label these here just to remind us that these are CP minus there, CP minus here, that since each of those rings has a minus one charge and we have two of those, that tells us to have overall electrical neutrality, that the iron must be ferrous, it must be in a formal plus two oxidation state. So this is what ferrocene looks like from the side. And it's a remarkable compound because for a compound that has iron two plus in it, we can actually sublime it. It acts much more like an organic compound than it does any sort of inorganic compound. So this is a sort of a side view. And then let's look at the top view of ferrocene. So again, we have two five member rings. And this is looking down on the compound. So this is the top ring, the ring that is closest to us. So there's a number of different ways that the two rings can be arranged. And those different arrangements will lead to a different point group symmetry for the molecule. So one of the ways 
I would draw the second ring, and I would draw it in green just to make sure where it is and distinguish it. So you notice that in this particular case, that the two rings line up. Here's where the iron atom would be. In these cases where the rings line up, we call this the eclipsed confirmation. Eclipsed confirmation. So we like to ascertain the point group symmetry for first, as is our one to do, we will look for a high order rotation axis in the plane of the whiteboard. So perhaps going through an axis through the iron atom. And we notice that if we rotate by 72 degrees, 72 degree rotation here, that the carbon atom here will line up with the carbon there, carbon to carbon, and it will work for both the, the near ring. So in black is a ring that's in front of the whiteboard. The green ring is behind the board and we consider the iron atom to be in the plane of the board. If this is true, if we do this 72 degree rotation, we notice that all the atoms will line up with their former identities. So it'll be imperceptible that it's actually been rotated. So therefore, this rotation is a symmetry operation of the group. And we would recognize this as being a C5 rotation. Also, by the same token, if we go in the opposite direction, we would have a C5 to the minus 1. So C5 and C5 to the minus 1 are the high order rotation axes for ferrocene. We can look for other rotational axes in this particular plane, but we won't find any. And part of the reason for that is to recognize that it's a five member ring. Five is a prime number, so it has no divisors other than itself and one. So we're not able to break it up into any other rotations. So now let's look if we have rotations in any other axes. And one uh, spot where we might, might try this, through one vertex and through the uh, midpoint of the, the opposite side. So for example, if we try something like this, and then try for a rotational axis this way, so a C2, to essentially flip it over, we would see that all the atoms would line up. And for each vertex, I can make one of these C2s. So I notice that my high order rotation axis is a C5, I have five C2s that are perpendicular to my C5. What does that tell me? It tells me that I have a D group and the D group that I have is D5. So I have some sort of D5 group. Our next requirement for ascertaining the point group symmetry is to look for a mirror. And since we already know where the high order rotation axis is, it's perpendicular to the whiteboard. If there is a horizontal mirror, for example, it's got to be in the plane of the board. And there is. It reflects the top ring into the bottom ring. And this plane runs uh, straight through the iron atom and is parallel to both of the top and bottom CP rings. So that tells us that we have the point group D5H. So the point group symmetry of eclipsed ferrocene is going to be D5H. So let's see if we have any other possible confirmations of ferrocene that are going to be uh, interesting. A second way that we can arrange the rings is to have the bottom ring, the green ring, such that its vertices are exactly in between the vertices of the upper ring. So let me just kind of erase a little bit of this to emphasize the fact that the green ring is actually below the plane of the board. And we can put our iron atom in the center. So we want to look for the symmetry operations of this particular molecule. Again, we want to look for a possible C5. So we notice that we rotate by 72 degrees that the carbons of the upper ring will line up with each other. We also notice the same thing will be true for the carbons of the bottom ring. So it works for the top ring and the bottom ring. So therefore, we do have C5 as a symmetry operation of the group. If we rotate clockwise 72 degrees, 
we will also end up. So that's C5 to the minus 1. And those are the only rotational axes that we have that are coaxial with this. They're perpendicular to the plane of the board. Again, because 5 is a prime number. So our next step is to look for C5 axes, uh, C2 axes that are perpendicular to the C5. And there, there are here, and they're a little tricky to find because the C2 will actually go in between the green ring and the black ring. So it's halfway between the vertices. And I'll come out the other side. So here's where the actual C2 axis is. It goes along here. And the effect of this particular rotation will take this vertex here, which is above the ring. When we turn over the molecule, that will go to where the green ring is now. And the carbon from the green ring, when we do the C2, will flip over to here. So this is kind of interesting because the C2 axis is going between the vertices. And we have five of these different axes. So there's another one, for example. And there's going to be a C2 there. So we notice that we have a C5 like we did before. We have five C2s. So we have five C2s that are perpendicular to our C5. So therefore, this tells us that we have a D5 group of some type. To finish our classification, we have to look for mirrors. Now, we can recognize pretty quickly, remember that the black ring is above the board, the green ring is below the board. If we had a horizontal mirror, the horizontal mirror would have to be in the plane of the whiteboard, and it would have to reflect the black ring on top into equivalent atoms below the board, and there's nothing there. Similarly, the mirror would reflect the green atoms from the green ring at the bottom above the plane of the board, and there's no position there. So we absolutely do not have a horizontal mirror in this case, but we do have mirrors, and we have lots of them, and the mirrors are going to go from one vertex to the other. So along like this, we have a mirror, so it reflects the lower right to the upper left part of the molecule. And we can do that for every uh, vertex of the top ring, for example. Because we'll go through a vertex of the top ring and a vertex of the bottom ring at the same time. And there's five distinct of these mirrors. By use of the way, uh, conventional nomenclature, these sort of act like vertical mirrors but since we're in a D group, they're given a special designation and they're referred to as dihedral mirrors. So we call this group D5D. Uh, just to avoid confusion, there is no such thing as D5V. There is, there is no such thing. So either you have D5H or you have D5D if you have a mirror. If there's no mirrors, you'd ha simply have the group D5. So this is D5D. Now D5D actually has another interesting rotational axis that we should examine here. So going back to the C5 that we had at top, so this is, the axis is perpendicular to the plane of the board and the rotation is in the plane of the board. We actually have another rotational axis. And we notice that if we rotate by a tenth of a turn, so if we go by 36 degrees here, this would take, if we rotate this, it's going to move this vertex of the ring here but still on top. So it's going to be right in front of the, the uh, carbon of the bottom ring, but it's going to be above it. If we take that position and then reflect it with a horizontal mirror, it's going to take a carbon in front, essentially a black carbon, and reflect it into a green carbon. And there is a green carbon there. So we recognize this combination of a proper rotation followed by a horizontal mirror as being the two steps of an improper rotation. So in this case, for D5D, not only do we have a C5, but our actual high-order rotation axis is improper, and we actually have this S10. So we have an S10 symmetry operation, just as we have S10 to the minus 1. So um, this pattern for improper rotations of having eclipsed, um, having staggered conformations as opposed to eclipse conformations will be very common uh, for different types of point groups. So if you notice that, you'll start to notice in those cases that you might want to look for improper rotations. By the same reasoning, we notice something else that's critical about this particular conformation, and that's if I take a, make a vector from any point to the center, and I go, so this is above the ring, goes down to the center, so now I continue in this direction, it's going to go below the 
plane of the board and it's going to reach a carbon. So no matter which direction I go, if I go in the opposite direction, the same distance, I will also reach an identical atom. That tells us in D5D that I have the inversion operation as well.